let's start our topic for the day. First and foremost, uh, very, very good evening to one and all and welcome to the, today's webinar. I'm thankful to Bangalore Skull Base Society, uh, Bangalore Skull Base Institute for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on this, on this topic of vertigo, which is definitely um, has its own learning curve for understanding and uh, we learn every day in this uh, magical topic, I could say. Though not my core area of interest, I have my colleague who's also on the panel today. She's a part participant, Dr. Aisha, who is a little bit more spe specialized in what I go. She does a lot of work on, on the diagnosis and the management bit. But then having an interest in otology and uh, uh, lateral skull base, so that also keeps me involved in uh, the subject of what I go. So let's uh, begin. I am a consultant at Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. I also head the units, ENT unit at HBS Hospital and uh, Prime Care Hospital uh, in uh, Bangalore. Got a team and uh, I have special interest in skull based pathology, snoring and obstructive sleep ap apnea and allergy and immunotherapy. Yeah, before I start my topic, I always like to acknowledge the teachers who have who keep teaching me every day and also the great institutes from which I've passed through. So my talk is going to be just about 10 to 15 slides. I'm going to make it very easy for you. I don't want to end up complicating too much uh, and then, you know, uh, creating it, leaving it as a very difficult to understand topic. So since we just have about an hour, so we'll make it fun, we'll make it interactive. Uh, in fact, I would even suggest that, you know, you unmute yourself in between so that we can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, and that will make it more interactive and we'll have more of take-home messages with us. I, I, I wouldn't want to actually look at the chat box, so feel free to unmute unless you're in a public place and you feel embarrassed to really literally do that. So my colleague here will look at the chat box and will share the um, question or the comment with me, but then in between, I would be asking a few questions and I would really appreciate it if you unmute one of you or, you know, whoever wants to communicate can unmute and, and then we can have a short conversation in between. But we'll make sure that we finish it within uh, within 60 minutes or maybe plus or minus five minutes. So this paper, please, uh, you, you this is anyway going to be recorded and it's going to go up on YouTube. Uh, but nevertheless, this is one paper which uh, I have taken, you know, a lot of uh, information. This was published by Belgium Group in 2016. And uh, in fact, uh, this is quite helpful because in vertigo, remember that before you even touch the patient, uh, if you're interested in vertigo and you see patients with vertigo, you should spend a considerable amount of time with history, trying to understand, trying to speak to the patient and understand his background as to his symptom, his symptomatology. And then the examination just completes your diagnosis. And uh, going by my experience, more than 90%, 90 to 95% of your cases, at the end of history and examination, you actually have a diagnosis. And trust me, in what I go, the diagnosis are few. You don't have like 100 things to differentiate, to differentiate between. And it's and the medic medications are like hardly another few, and then uh, there's a lot of counseling involved and, and uh, exercises involved. So go through this paper, and I'm going to. This is an acronym. S O Stone is an acronym, uh, which means the full form of it. It comprises eight different dimensions. That is S O S T O N E D. Each one stands for a word. And yeah, that's it. So that's the expansion. It's symptoms. Uh, I mean, the characteristic of the symptoms and how often those, those symptoms appear. And since, like, how, what's the duration? Uh, and what are the triggers that cause these symptoms? And then the otology. That means what are the auditory findings? What are the otological specific to the otology? And in neurological associated features, how is the evolution of the problem being and what is the duration of the symptom. So if you don't have to remember so stoned, but then you'll have to remember to, uh, to capture your history under all these headings and uh, that, what, that makes your history complete and 
that is going to direct you to your diagnosis. So uh, what are you going to ask in symptoms? All right, it's, we have to understand the terminology. See, for vertigo for me may not be vertigo for the patient. The patient must have read vertigo somewhere or some GP must have told him that you have vertigo or he must have Googled it up. So vertigo is a broad terminology. You should always ask the patient whether he's got classical spinning sensation. And what kind of spinning sensation? Is it a head rotatory vertigo? That means does he feel there's something spinning inside his head? Or is it a surrounding rotatory vertigo? That means does he feel that the surroundings are going round and round? So, which again, which points towards a diagnosis. Because see, vertigo as such, if I have to complete it, it will take at least three to four sessions. But broadly, head rotatory vertigo, something spinning inside the head could be a migraine or could be a neurological problem. But if he classically has that ringa ringa roses kind of a situation where things are going all round and round, that points to a labyrinthine cause. Similarly, dizziness, just that vague feeling of lightheadedness and dizziness and associated nausea, you know, Meniere's disease, nausea, migraine, nausea, postural instability, where you're unable to even stand properly, forget walking and all, the, the whole posture is unstable. And falling, does he, have, does he have any episodes of syncope? Does he fall down, he or she? And then whether there is any rotatory or linear sensations, is there a tilt in his, uh, in his, in his visual axis? Does he feel that is the objects are not aligned in the X and Y plane and they're kind of tilted? Or does he feel the things are, you know, actually jumping around, they're not stable, they are like hopping, jack-in-the-box phenomenon kind of thing? Or drunken for people who, I mean, you can ask, they ask a person who's not an alcoholic, are you, do you feel drunk? It's not really, you're not going to like that. But yeah, some people, it's just like a drunken feeling or a lateral pulsion is like, being to this, the feeling of being pushed to one side or to and fro rocking. So all these are important. You can place them and link them to a diagnosis once you keep reading the subjects, reading the topics. But you need to find out what exactly is, you have to decipher that chakra. So chakra is not just dizziness under evaluation, but a few lines you should know about the characteristics of the vertigo. So that is important. And then how often? Is it an acute onset or is it like a chronic problem? And does it like come in periods? Does it come very frequently on and off? Or is it always there continuously? Or is just once and it is gone two years back and he's just come for an opinion because he's met you? So you need to know whether it's an episodic, episodic phenomenon or whether it's a continuous phenomenon. And yes, since when? How, how how did it, how was it? Was it after a viral illness or a head trauma or any intervention that has taken place? Or has he just traveled back and landed and then, you know, over, say, over a 24 hours journey or 18 hours journey? And then definitely, you know, you're disoriented. You feel you have a jet lag. So we cannot think of big things you have to counsel and send back. It could be probably related to the journey. Uh, so that's important. And uh, what are the triggers? Whether it's head movements, whether it's rolling over in bed, movement of the head, or while walking in a supermarket, walking in semi-darkness, during coughing, or any visual stimuli, noise, uh, noise-based vertigo, loud noise. And then you ask about the otological symptoms, whether there's any fullness, oral fullness, whether there is tinnitus, associated hearing loss, and does the hearing loss actually improve up after a period of uh, vertigo? So all these things will take you to a diagnosis. And then neurological. So we have to ask about, you know, if he's got a weakness in his limbs or a very severe headache, which has never occurred in the past. Uh, again, paresthesias and uh, palpitations, speech problems, double vision, cervical problems. And how has it, has the problem been worsening or is it the same? And uh, what is the duration like, yeah, uh, of this that we spoke about it and another uh, thing. So now coming to acute, so this is about so stone, this, you will have to essentially get through all this, find out detailed history. And now you have to place your patient into one of the 
uh, places. Okay, so what is the commonest cause? We'll keep it as an open discussion. Somebody please tell some common causes of what I do. Five common causes. Please unmute and speak. Anybody unmute, please? BPPV. Yeah, very nice. Correct. BPPV is very common. Then? Um, vestibular migraines. Yes, very nice. Migraine is common. Then? Stroke. Yeah, stroke from the serious point of view. Yes, then? Menias disease. Yeah, menias is something that we can see not so frequently, but yes, definitely. And the first one here, vestibular neuritis, neuritis, right? It's in an acute setting, we do see vestibular neuritis. So just about five, if you ask me, I would say just concentrate on these five. And then 90 to 95%, you would put your patient in one of these categories. And the remaining are like kind of not that common entities. So it's either going to be a BPPV, it's going to be a vestibular neuritis, it's going to be either a migraine, migraineous vertigo, or um, uh, it, it could be a meniere's, or you know maybe a stroke in a in an emergency uh, situation. So now let's talk about the acute vertigo. We'll differentiate between the two common uh, the entities that we see in this in the ER patient coming in with severe intractable vertigo. He's unable to turn his hair. He's unable to walk around. He's just vomiting. And, you know, the usual scene is about three to four people would have got the patient to the casualty. So now as, uh, you know, they'll call you, come on, we need an ENT evaluation. The resident is going to emergency or consultant or the resident is going to call you. So now you need to come and quickly take a history. You can't spend too much time there if he's, in, if he's into a stroke that's evolving and you take half an hour for your the history over there. So stone thinking about the paper and, you know, thinking about my webinar, then it's, you're going to maybe in losing a patient. So quickly you have to, within about two to four minutes, you'll have to finish off your history. So when you are thinking of a labyrinthitis or a vestibular neuritis, what is the difference between in presentation between vestibular? Okay, I've got a few colleagues around, so I'm going to talk to them also. What is the difference between vestibular neuronitis and labyrinthitis? What is the difference as far as the symptoms go? Both look pretty same. Balance. Balance, both will have imbalance. Labyrinthitis is a layman term. No, no, it's, it's a different thing. Good, who, Dr. Javer, is it? Taufir, sir. Okay, Dr. Taufir, sorry. Yeah, so labyrinth usually have a hearing loss, associated hearing loss. All right. So that's the differentiating feature between a vestibular neuronitis and a vestibular neuronitis generally comes with severe vertigo. They don't complain of hearing loss, acute. And both both these could be, they could be having an ongoing viral or some three days of, uh, they'll have a, they would have just recovered from a viral uh, upper respiratory infection or something and they'll come. So neuro labyrinthitis will have one-sided hearing loss. But neuronitis, the same vertigo, but they don't really complain of hearing loss. All right. And you, the, the moment you cannot do a Dixal pike on them because movements of the head is going to trigger, they'll just vomit on you. So make sure if you're doing anything, their they the stomach is empty. Otherwise, if you do too much, they're just going to puke, they're just going to throw up. And remember that vestibular neuronitis, as, as it progresses, they, 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 they generally start feeling better. You put them on anti uh, vertigo medication. And put them on rest after three, five days, and generally they start doing. If it's a labyrinthitis, then yeah, maybe an antibiotic cover. You don't want it to get into a suppurative bacterial labyrinthitis. Uh, so they generally, over a period of time, they'll start becoming okay. Uh, and then stroke. All right. Now, how do you differentiate when you're going to the ER now? And what are the features that will tell you that this may be a stroke? Anybody? UMN palsy, sir. Facial deviation. Sorry? Uh, upper motor neuron palsy, facial palsy, deviation of the lower part of the face. Yeah, that could be if you have the facial nerve involved. Yes, but cerebellar strokes. See, the commonest cause of a stroke is cerebellar lesion. How many cerebellar strokes will come with facial nerve palsy? Not many. Yeah, that's true. Sir. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. true. So how will you see? I'll, let me give you a, this is my, what my professor taught me once. If the patient is unable to stand, with, with uh, you know, without support, think of a stroke, think of a cerebellar stroke. This person is going to be really scared to just stand and he's going to fall on either side. He's going to show his, that's called postural, severe postural instability if there is a case of vertigo. 
uh, sorry, uh, uh, what I got because of a central origin. It will not be provoked at all. You, he just cannot stand. He'll be really, and then you go into examining. Then I'll come to that later on how to figure out. But remember, if the person is is having a severe what I go, is unable to even stand and move around. Uh, think of a, 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 a central, uh, you know, a cerebellar stroke. And then, yeah, I'm going to come to how you're going to examine uh, the patient. So, and then, yes, history wise, we will have to take the history of high blood pressure and diabetes and all that predisposing factors. Now, the episodic type that we usually see in our OPDs, you know, the acute setting usually comes to the casualty. And they, they, by the time you go, MRI would have already been done. So, you would have you know, nowadays in bigger cities. So, you just have to work on your bit. But then, yes, still in tight cities and probably places where they go to smaller nursing homes, you have to go there and actually uh, you have to decide on, you know, uh, whether to get go for an imaging or I'm going to go to another paper which will easily tell us about, uh, you know, whether we can, whether we uh, imaging is needed or we can, you know, just send the patient home with some counseling. Now, episodic what I common is is BPPV, okay? In BPPV, the patient has got he gives a history of periodic um, vertigos, which are episodic and generally trigger with head movements. So you do a Dixal break, you come to know, you, and then you have to do an Eplis to, you know, just do it. No medicines are actually needed. Only a good repositioning and then call them back, maybe an, maybe an SOS medication, call them back after a week, repeat the Dixal break, make sure it's negative, it's positive, do it again, and then you send them home with some home-based exercises for BPPV, like band off exercises. Then we've got menial disease. Menial disease is slightly, you know, they, it, they, they, it comes over a period of time. You don't get a first menial disease in your clinic generally. They come with, they would have treated them for gastroenteritis. They would have treated them for various uh, um, other problems because thinking of, uh, uh, they would have thought that it could be a food poisoning. They would have gone to a clinic and even the, um, the, uh, uh, the pa patient could say, you know, I've had some food somewhere and that's why I've got giddiness, I've got vomiting. So uh, that's what meaning is. Remember that they'll have fluctuating hearing loss. Whenever they have an episode of meaning disease, when they have an episode of vertigo, that time they'll complain that my I get otinitis, one side otinitis, I have an oral fullness, and then I get these spells and then I throw up and then I'm better, my hearing actually improves. And it doesn't last like a few seconds like meaning like uh, BPPV, it stays on for hours, sometimes even a day. And then, you know, over two to three days, they start uh, getting back to their routine. Then vestibular migraine, yeah, they'll have that classical migraine symptoms of headaches, on and off, photophobia, phonophobia, and uh, not sometimes not classical. Sometimes the patients, even with the headache symptoms, they come with only what I go, you do all of this, and you roll, roll out a dick soil pipe, you roll out audiometry is fine. Many diseases, they'll have usually one-sided hearing loss. Um, so vestibular migraine is something that we see very commonly in our practice. And then the others, like I mentioned, the vestibular paroxysmia and the superior semicircular dehiscence is something that is not very commonly seen, but yet you should know that they exist and they should be a part of your differential diagnosis. When they are, they are non-responders or they keep coming back to your clinic, you think about that at the back of your mind. And then the chronic, again, these two entities, when you cannot place your patient anywhere, you put them into triple PD, uh, where you have very vague symptoms. The patient's a dizziness, light headedness. It, it comes on for, the, he has this chronic, he has, he's got multiple prescriptions. He's going around meeting a lot of doctors, very phobic patient. He has sometimes even that can have panic attacks. Uh, and bilateral vestibulopathy, yeah, they will have some, they'll give you these symptoms of oscillopsia. They would have a, trigger like an neurotoxic medication or some infection uh, and uh, or some ongoing autoimmune disorders. So this is with the history. And then, yeah, the million dollar question that uh, is to how to differentiate whether it's central or peripheral when a patient comes in the ER, you no, know? it's so important. And this is, this was actually, this paper was given by neurology, neuro, neurology group. They came uh, about this and said that, you know, this three-step bedside examination of the eyes is more sensitive than early MRI because sometimes that stroke and evolution, you do an MRI, you can the uh, findings would not have appeared on your on your MRI. 
uh, but then you will be happy and saying that the MRI is normal, the radiologist has declared as normal, but then there may be an evolving stroke and you send him home and then you are in trouble. The patient will come back after two to three days with a hemiplegia, you know, with hemi, maybe hemiparesis or hemiplegia and or more severe uh, uh, CNS problems. So hints is head, I stands for head impulse, N stands for um, nystagmus and S is Q deviation, all right? So now look at this image. Patient, you ask the patient to look into when you're testing him, you ask him to focus on your forehead or your nose and quickly turn, a sharp turn towards one side. The patient should maintain fixation to your forehead or nose. You should give him that instruction beforehand. If he's unable to do that, he or she, when you turn the head and the eyeballs tend to move in that direction, and then he's trying to fix his gaze back. Then think that is called a corrective saccade. Think of a unilateral vestibulopathy, vestibulopathy on that side. There's something wrong with the labyrinth on the other side. And you can do it on the other side as well. So ideally speaking, when you jerk the head after asking the patient to fixate on your nose or your forehead, he shouldn't actually look in the direction of the head turn. He has eyes should remain focused on your midline. But if he's not able to do that, if he or she has got a corrective saccade, think it, think it as a peripheral uh, cause of vertigo. So in hints, if there is at least one of the following, that means a normal head impulse test or an nystagmus that changes the direction on gaze, a gaze changing nystagmus or a positive test of skew, think of a uh, central problem. So think of a uh, maybe a stroke or a, or a CNS lesion, any other CNS lesion. So these three things, I'm going to take you through a short video. It's available on YouTube. Now that you're all glued to the screens, I think this is going to stay in our, uh, going to go in our long memory, long term memory. So you play it on full screen. This is the audible audio vision. Okay. So this is, you know, what is this a vertical? Or oh, you can listen to me as, as the video is going. This is a vertical nystagmus. You see the nystagmus of the nystagmus of uh, central origin is non fatigable That means it will go on beating generally and it doesn't have a latency. You, you, you just start examining the, without any latency, it will start beating. And it goes on. So you can have a vertical, you can have a direction changing. Now look at the direction changing nystagmus. When the patient, when I, this person is looking to the right, it's beating. The fast component is beating to the right. When he looks to the left, it's beating to the left. Look at that. See, now beating to the left way, the fast component. And when he's looking to the right, it's beating to the right. So this is a direction changing nystagmus. Points towards a central lesion. And then this is called a direction changing. Then you have, this is a test of skew. This is the head impulse test. So this fellow looks like he's having a central lesion because he's looking at me. Has anybody, has everybody understood the head impulse test? If, now, if nobody has understood, please, you can ask me now and we'll go through it again. Anybody? Or shall we proceed? So initial part of my, during my training, I was painting and very difficult to understand all these things, but then it's quite simple, actually. So again, once more, all right. Uh, so look at the head impulse test. Now this person is was asked, he's, imagine he's a patient now, and I'm, I'm gonna ask him to look into my, look, look at my forehead or my nose. And I'm gonna tell him, this person is looking at me on my screen, and I'm gonna move his head towards one side. He should continue looking at my eye, uh, looking at my nose. So let's see what he does. Once more, we'll ask, we'll, we'll ask this person to look at us once more. Okay, wait. Okay, one minute, one minute. Let's hold on. Nystagmus, is it understood? The direction changing nystagmus? Anybody who wants me to repeat that? Yeah. 
the uh, direction changing nystagmus. Is that clear? Thumbs up, everybody. Sir, so I in... you understood the fast and the slow component of the nystagmus, right? So Sir. if you ask, say, for example, ask the patient to look at your finger and then take your finger to one side. As he moves his eye and then he's got a nystagmus that is the fast component is moving to the right. And now you ask him, other side, that's called a direction changing nystagmus, not a unidirection nystagmus, that points more to a stroke. All right, then shall we proceed? That is okay. Now, now we'll ask this patient to be go for the head impulse test. Okay, this is over. Direction changing is diagnosis. Remember, this will be non fatigable. We'll, we'll go on doing it for minutes to hours. It'll go on, you know, the nystagmus. So now see this. Yeah. Okay, now you guys have to interpret. Now, this person did his, was it, were his eyes fixed on, were his eyes fixed on my nose? See? Yes, thumbs up. Thumbs up, everybody. Any any questions on this? So this is a normal vestibular ocular reflex. Okay, so his uh, he has his his his, his once more to the next one. Yeah, now yeah, normal. This is normal. He's he's looking at me. So if imagine a situation where the eyeballs continue to move with his head in that plane, that is called an abnormal HIT. This is a normal head impulse test. That means he's, he continues to look at my forehead or my nose. When his eyeballs follow his head movement, it's called an abnormal HIT. So normal HIT, when, is, when it's abnormal, think of a peripheral lesion. Peripheral means think of a labyrinthine lesion. So normal HIT means that the labyrinths are functioning properly. It's not a labyrinth, it's not a peripheral, it's not a peripheral uh, uh, vestibular apathy. It's a, it's a neurological problem. This is called test of skew. Can you see just on occluding one eye, the other eye ball is just moving randomly here and there. This is also a sign of, this is called skew deviation. You just occlude one eye and the other eye moves. That's called skew deviation on it moves on usually on the vertical axis. This points to a central neuro, uh, neurological disorder. So coming again, three tests, hints. And this has been endorsed by American Heart Association, American Stroke Association. It has been published in Stroke, which is a, a journal of the American Heart Association. And it's the neurologists who have endorsed this. And they say that this three-step bedside ocular examination is actually more sensitive than early MRI diffusion weighted imaging. So we should all, as ENT surgeons, as people um, handling vertigo should know this entity. All right, look at head impulse once more. The first column is the nystagmus, which is bound vestibular, which is direction changing, which is non-fatigable. It doesn't stop. It goes in, it's rhythmic. It doesn't stop and goes on oscillating. Think of a central lesion. A normal head impulse test, wherein the patient continues to fixate on your forehead or on your nose, even on moving the head to one side. Think of a normal HIT and rule out a peripheral lesion and think of it being more of a central uh, problem, central uh, the stroke or a central nervous system. Disorder. And then skew deviation is on uh, occluding one eye, occlusion, occlusion, occluding with a uh, occluder or with your hand you will see that the other eyeball moves up, either in the, or mostly in the vertical plane, it moves up. That's called a skew deviation, again, points to a centrally occurring uh, vertigo. Okay, good, so that was a nice video. Yeah. Okay. No. Fine. So now, as we we'll quickly go, our patient has come to you, and because acute vertigo is something that you should know, you take the details of the patient, find out if he's alert, 
and conscious that his pulse is okay, blood pressure, make sure that he's not, you know, going into hypoglycemia because of which he's feeling lightheaded or dizzy. And once you do that, always do a quick examination of the cranial nerves, find out about any uh, hyper or uh, hypernasality. That means the palate is involved. Uh, the speech, whether it's dysarthric or normal, facial movements, for facial nerve weakness, tongue protrusion for hypoglossal nerve, soft palate uh, mobility to complete your cranial nerve, uh, nerve examination. And uh, that points to, you know, any of the other nerves involved, it points to a central uh, evolving stroke or a central uh, neural system disorder. Then uh, the routine ear examination, look for any uh, uh, middle ear uh, disease, middle ear perforation, cholesteatomas, which can have labyrinthitis, which can have coexisting uh, labyrinthine fistula. Think about yeah, or if it's a, if it's a stroke, if it's uh, if it's a trauma, look at hemotympanum. They can have severe labyrinthine concussion uh, that can patient can present with you know after a head trauma they can have otygon. You need to rule out whether the head trauma uh, is uh, because of a temporal bone fracture or because of uh, or is a cerebral concussion. So uh, an examination of the ear will show you uh, maybe hemotympanum which will point towards maybe a temporal bone fracture. And then you can always, you know, if it's a head injury, definitely would be on the safer side of doing an imaging and documenting that. So that's to complete your ear examination. This is something a step beyond. You should understand what is saccades and what is pursuit. Saccades, it's a look at this image now. This is my patient. I've asked him to look at my fingers on each side. I've put up, you know, say two sticks. And then I've asked this patient to look at my fingers not as a smooth pursuit, but as a sacket. He has to look at my left finger and then my right, left and then right. Quickly move between the fingers. That's called sacket. And a normal patient should be able to, you know, quickly move from one finger to the other finger. If you feel that the range is full, then it's normal. Or if you feel it's limited, that he's not able to, you know, get uh, fixate to your finger or your target, then it's limited. And whether the accuracy is hypometric, that means you ask him to look at your finger, he's just looking somewhere in between. He's not actually going till your finger. He, he looks straight, he looks at one finger and then maybe he's just stopping before, much before the other finger. That's called hypometric. Hypometric is he's actually overshooting and he's going on looking at the corner of the room. That is overshot even your finger. So it could be hypometric or hypometric. Similarly, vertical. Ask him to look up and down. If he's looking at the, the sky and then, you know, is that is like hypermetric or if he continues to look at you and he's trying to look up but then not reaching up to your finger, it is hypometric. That means he's not reaching your target of the finger that you have asked him to reach. So this has to be documented and then pursue it. Yeah, smooth. Now you ask the patient to follow horizontally. Follow your finger. Horizontally, follow your finger. What it is? Initially, that was like a bouncing for back and forth between two points. Smooth per, per, per seat is, you know, you have to literally, it's a dynamic test when you ask the patient to follow your finger vertically and horizontally. Now, if the range is full, it is smooth, it's called like a smooth per seat. If it becomes like block, saccadic is like, you know, the patient is actually blocking in between like a cog wheel kind of a movement where he's, uh, he's not smoothly following your finger, but he's actually breaking it, breaking his vision into bits and pieces. That's called a saccadic pursuit. That means it's not a smooth pursuit, it's saccadic. And then again, the vertical, it could be the smooth or saccadic. And between, yeah, they'll have a lot of mistakes. They have a lot of mistakes. Think of a central area. Now, yeah, to complete a neurological examination, you should do your sensations, fine touch, temperature, and pain. Uh, finger nose test is, we know these things that we learn as interns about cerebellar signs. Uh, we know about uh, asking the patient to touch uh, your finger and his nose, his or her nose. She should be able to do that with eyes open and then with eyes closed. This diadochonic kinesia is asking the patient to flip flop his hands over the other palm uh, and then again open eyes, close eyes. Romberg's test is uh, when you can ask a patient to stand up and, okay, if he's not able to do the finger nose, if he's not able to do this uh, smoothly, then points to a cerebellar lesion. Romberg's test, if the patient is able to, you know, 
uh, unable to see, able to stand up. When the moment he closes his eyes, he's just falling off. He's just unstable. Think of a central lesion. Antenberger is, you ask the patient to march on the spot, maybe with his hands stretched forward. He, he uh, consistently, he or she will move towards one side, which will point towards the labyrinthine dysfunction of that particular side. And uh, yeah, those are the cerebellar signs. And Dick's Hulpec is something that we should all do that, that points towards BPPV. But in an acute setting, yeah, he will vomit. He or she will vomit because doing a Dick's Hulpec for a vestibular neuron in this patient is no. Uh, you just take a history, do the hints examination. And if you feel that you know, the, the side of the labyrinth is, is decompensated, is undergoing an inflammation, where the head impulse test is going to be positive to one side, then you don't have to go and do a Dixal pack. That patient may not come back to you again because already he doesn't want to move around. He or she's happy in, in the wheelchair and you tell, no, you sit up on the bed. I'm going to put you down, turn your head towards one side. It's, is it going to be a nightmare? For a stroke patient, obviously, when you do your hints and you feel that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an evolving stroke, then again, you don't have to waste time. You have to immediately get your neurology uh, colleagues to help you out with managing the stroke. So that's about it. Uh, I think this was this was just an approach to what I go. So uh, that means you know how you approach a patient, take the history, do the basic examination, and come to your probable diagnosis. If you talk about you know the management bit of it, it could probably be staged to another webinar or another session. Uh, I think we'll just have some discussion. We also have uh, my colleague Dr. Aisha, who specializes you know in what I go. So she's also there, I think. Are you there, Dr. Aisha? Can you hear me? Is she there? Friends, okay. So I, I'm going to take some questions on my own and we're also, also going to, you know, involve people who are into what I go practice to help us out, decipher some of the mysteries of what I go. So we do, there's a question, do we always have Frenzel glasses in our period? No, you don't have to, you don't need Frenzel glasses. Uh, most of the cases, you know, in your, uh, as an ENT practitioner who sees a variety of disorders, you can pick up the vertigo, especially for the BPP, you can see the torsion, you see a misdiagnosis which has latency, which is, uh, which is fatigable. So you know that in most cases you can, pick, you can pick it up. But in cases, you know, when you have, uh, when the patient is already on uh, anti vertigo medicines, where his service stays, he's on something for five days, for 10 days, or sometimes, you know, we see people with BPP coming for, uh, coming with months of uh, so and so drugs. So those, yeah, those, you know, you may not be able to pick up the, uh, the nystagmus. So the frenzy glasses will help you uh, magnify that, or even a VNG goggle, you know, that will also pick up the subtle. Um, nystagmus, which is not picked up by the bare eye. Yeah. So, any more questions? So, there is, sir, all investigations are normal and patient not getting better for months and high doses. What can be the cause? Oh, right. See, these uh, vertigo is actually our body has got a physiology, a beautiful phys balanced physiology. You can read about it. So it does just imagine somebody pushes you from behind. What happens? Do you fall generally? No, you don't fall because the body senses it that you're off your axis. Somebody is pushing and you immediately regain your balance. You don't go on falling. So this itself shows that we have very sharp balance. Now that is always working towards getting your body back to the the normal equilibrium. Now, what do these anti vertigo medicines of various uh, mechanisms of action? They actually come in between right, to suppress that uh, in order to reduce the you know the severity of the symptoms of say vertigo or uh, the uh, nausea, vomiting. But they actually come in between. So we'll have to taper them off. Number one, go by the history, find out what's the cause, and start tapering off all those medicines apart from Menier's disease. Okay, apart from Menier's disease, there is no other ENT, labyrinth related disorder, whether it's BPPV, whether it is uh, vestibular neuronitis, whether it is uh, labyrinthitis. There is no disorder where, you know, you give, you give it for like months and years together. Menier's is only one disorder where you give it for a prolonged period of time because you never know when it, you know, 
when they have these episodes. So that's one thing. So start reducing the dose, take a history, try to come to a diagnosis. It, if, if it could be vestibular migraine, then you have to shift to anti-migraine medicines, not your anti-vertigo medicines. You start giving prophylaxis for migraine. Maybe that patient of your, I'm addressing this to S, the person who is S, yeah, they will, they, maybe the patient will respond. Calorific test commonly done. Yeah, you only tell me for what, why do we do this? Which test? What is the, what is the basis of calorie test? Calorific test. Okay. Caloric test. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Taufir, why, why are you doing the calorie test? To know whether uh, any, to confirm peripheral uh, Correct. cause of a type 1. Yeah, do you want to do it for BPPV? No, right? No, sir, like uh, in, like in, in cases whether like we are doubtful, no, sir? Yes, it's good to do I it. Like it. in Meniere's disease, yes. You, you will have a hyperfunctioning labyrinth. When you're doing it, one is, yeah, subjective. You ask the patient to find out you put cold water, you put warm water and see if there is nystagma, see if there is, uh, you know, a patient is having symptoms. Or, yeah, if you have a VNG and you have VNG goggles, that's more sensitive to pick it up. Yes, it can be done. Yes. And the other question is, please suggest, uh, yeah, is, uh, Dr. Taufir, is that is that okay for an answer? Okay, sir. Like, I wanted to know whether currently, uh, like, do we do this calorific test routinely we do it in or a uh... for chronic cases for uh, documenting for documentation purpose especially for uh, meniere's disease we do it yeah okay sir you talking about the icu and uh, you know declaring that the patient is dead that kind of a scenario Dr. no 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 sir no, routine clinic cases only sir. Like, okay, routine... I, I have never done it yeah you can try it out you can try it on somebody at home oh, okay okay sir. cows you know cows Cold huh. opposite water, same, no? Yeah. yeah. So normal, uh, in fact, uh, have you ever tried syringing with cold water, removing wax with cold water? Yeah, yeah, sir, I have. Uh... Yeah, don't try it. I'm just telling you. So we've had experiences, you know. That's why we make it, we bring it to room temperature and then we, yeah, uh, we, okay. we do the syringing because you're going to stimulate the labyrinth. So you can try it and you can say next time you can tell me your uh, experiences. Yeah. Any other Next question, please suggest good books for vertigo. There's there's a uh, Indian very senior uh, neurotologist, Dr. Anirban Biswas. So he's got a very good book about step-by-step, -step, you know, approaches to vertigo. That's uh, what I had read long back. Uh, but Dr. Aisha, can you can you recommend some books for vertigo? Dr. Aisha, are you there? Are you listening? I think she's, she's kind of busy, but yeah. Maybe you can pinch me. That's my WhatsApp number and I'll try to look at some yeah, books that... One is Anirban Miswas. He's a very famous neurotologist in, in the country. He's in West Bengal. A lot of his students are there who are here yeah, and total into, you know, what I go. So his books are quite good. And there are a lot of certificate courses. Now, once you finish your PG, if you're interested in what I go, rather than see this is something... If you sit down and read at home, it's going to be very complicated what I go. So spending time with somebody who is into what I go, even one or two days, that gives you a lot of insight about the subject and practical take-home messages because this is a subject where you can't read and you cannot understand much with only books. Practically, you have to actually ask questions and see some patients. So that's the certificate courses are available. Yeah, you can send me and I can, you know, if I come to know of something that I can definitely recommend a few certificates. Within two, three days, if you go, you'll get a way, you'll get an overall, what you don't learn in three years of MS, you'll get that understanding in two to three. Because these people would be people, your, your faculty, maybe they might not be into core what I go practice, but these people would definitely uh, be able to give you those take-home messages, especially for your day-to-day -day clinical practice. Yeah. And what I do is, yeah, there's one more question. Sir, if you don't give medicine to a dizzy patient, and even if it is BPPV, they will never be satisfied. And the moment they take Vertin or Stugiron, they feel better. And dix holpi can't be done unless we rule out cervical spondylitis. Now. And can we say Hint can replace dix holpi? No. See, you have to understand what is BPPV. Hint is not a diagnostic of BPPV. The diagnosis of BPV is lies with dix holpi. All right. And as a doctor, we should educate our patients. 
see we should not just give them uh, that do we should not write these names like this you know because the company people will either feel happy or upset when you write those names anyways we've got the message so those are anti what i go issue if you 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 have to fix the problem that is you're just trying to suppress the symptom with what in hospital on the fixing the problem is doing by by doing an appeals maneuver so diagnose bppv and cervical spondylolisthesis you're not going to do like uh, break their neck it's going to be how many patient of cervical spondylolisthesis are uh, do you see in daily i mean in a regular practice for whom this maybe a trauma patient yeah if you've got a trauma and unstable spine i wouldn't do that but i discuss with my neuro my with my colleagues from the spine side ortho it's not a contraindication where you you shouldn't do it unless there is a unstable neck or a impending uh, situation where you can where you have a cord compression kind of a scenario where you can't do it otherwise in most of the cases you can do a dixwall pike you shouldn't have to send an opinion to a spine surgeon for spine clearance before you're doing a dixwall pike go ahead and do it gently but do it in the right way do a good appeals maneuver first visit second visit teach them brander of exercises to be done at home they will be better otherwise trust me if you give them these medicines our patients tend to take these medicines on and on and on the bpp will disappear you will have this imbalance issue caused by by the medicines so do not prescribe chronic just give sos medicine something that's mouth dissolving for a bpp for a few days teach them the exercises let them do do that you see you will you will see your own patients getting better and bringing more patients to you okay any more questions good uh, dr saima uh, you have understood what i so let's that's so nice yeah any more quick questions we have we still have about 10 minutes starting uh, sir yes sir uh, sorry sir i i joined in very late i'm not sure whether you have uh, covered this topic but i have a clinical based question uh, one minute one minute let me just raise my volume somehow i feel my uh, i'm not able to hear the okay can you can you repeat your question yeah so my question is that uh, in uh, a patient who is having a dizziness and uh, the patient is actually having dizziness for uh, which lasts for um, a few minutes and it is positional and uh, when i did a dixal pike it was negative but when i made the patient to sit i could see the dizziness and as, as well as the torsional uh, nystagmus so uh, how to uh, diagnose this case what exactly which uh, canal uh, will it be see you will have to lasting for minutes you said because generally bpp will you, not you, last you, for... i mean like uh, uh, you can say uh, 15 to 20 seconds or maybe uh, 30 seconds all right so and, on uh, the... yeah and the patient was uh, having uh, dizziness as well as nystagmus while making the patient sit from the uh, the uh, dixal pike position while lying down there was no nystagmus no dizziness but when i made the patient to sit the patient was having a uh, dizziness as well as the nystagmus which is torsional torsional okay all right and was it fe again fatigable yes fatigable and was it unidirectional uh yeah it was unidirectional okay fine so uh, dr aisha do you have any inputs about this case let's discuss this case again later on how uh, may can you sure. identify yourself please uh, dr rai sir dr rai is over here oh dr rai okay from chennai ah uh, yes sir right now i am in uh, sharja okay dr rai fine let's uh, okay. think about this case once more and you know uh, sure right maybe it sure. could be an anterior canal it could be a, maybe another because classical uh, posterior semicircular canal bpp we should come you know in the uh, yes uh, arteria, uh, i even try the uh, roll test also uh, try to make the patient uh, uh, see on the uh, yeah horizontal semicircular canal but uh, that okay. one also the patient said there was a, a, a dizziness but i couldn't find the nystagmus during that time maybe a vng vng will help Okay. Okay. It is nystagmus free. Actually, it amplifies the uh, nystagmus and gives you a better uh, 
tracking of your eye movements in different positions. So I think a VNG okay. will definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. And does the does the patient have, does the patient have headaches? No, no, no headaches. Yeah. Then I think you should do a you should get a VNG done if you feel that the eye movements are not and. Did you stop the medicines before doing the the dexalpite? Uh, patient okay. actually was on medicines, I think so. Yeah, so just stop that. That also causes you know uh, wrong uh, results. So just let them uh, be off medicines for a few days and come back, and then you do do a dexalpite properly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Uh, still, majority of the and cases. The yeah. In, any role for uh, uh, V hit in this can, kind of cases? Uh, v, Video v, head impulse test. Yeah, yeah, you can do it. Why not? Yeah, you can do that. It'll it'll track the eye movements in a very nice way. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I think we have we, uh, the organizers here are saying that we've almost done with our time. It's six twenty. No, We're supposed to start it. Yeah. It's actually Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Okay. Fine. So any more questions? You can send me a WhatsApp. And then definitely we'll all learn together. We'll try to get in, you know, more expertise. Many patients get paraspinal muscle spasm. So can that be the cause? Oh, why? It's out of my paraspinal muscle spasm. For what? I, I don't know. I'm not sure about this paras. For what? Because Dr. Saima has to be more explanatory about this. Sir, so, uh, so I got cervical x-ray done for uh, one or two of my patients of vertigo. Uh, just to rule out the cervical spondylosis cause, and the report said paracervical uh, uh, muscle spasm, uh, paraspinal muscle spasm in the cervical region. So I was not sure whether this is really causing them the problem or not. Yeah, no. See, there are some uh, old-fashioned, you know, uh, ENT specialists or who are still very. Uh, they point. They, they talk about cervical spondylosis as a cause of vertigo. Go in clinical practice, and if you attend vertigo seminars, if you attend vertigo meets, and you look at the experts talking, who see like see, a common ENT may see about five to ten cases per day, but these are the people I'm talking. Who see about 20, 30 cases every day of vertigo, and they follow them up. So looking at cervical spondylosis as a, as a standalone cause of vertigo is is low, low, very low. All right, it, that means either you're missing BPPB or missing. Uh, uh, vestibular migraine, you're missing a menial disease, or you could be missing, you know, something like a labyrinthitis or something. Think of these common things and put your patients into one of these diagnoses and treat appropriately. Definitely, your patients will respond. So, we'll continue. Great presentation, simple and lucid talk. I appreciate Oh, thank you so much. That's a compliment. That's not a question. I appreciate the well, being a wonderful audience. It's really interactive and a great representation. I was told here that. Uh, you know how many? Very few people actually join in, but then uh, you've all really made this program a real success. Thank you so much for all of your participation, for taking time out. And I request you that whenever we post our uh, webinar, and you know, please uh, participate, and we will all of us try to you know upgrade, upscale ourselves in terms of our knowledge and skills. Hope you all have next episode. Oh yeah, sure. Let's think. Let's part two coming soon. Yeah, let's uh, work on that. Thank you so much.